You got a little bit of introduction about it. I'm not going to say anything about it other than to uh, emphasize or point out she died of the same disease her father died. Her father, if I remember correctly, he was 41 when he died. She was 39. Okay? They both contracted lupus somehow, which is an autoimmune disease. Um, she grew up Catholic in Milledgeville, Georgia, which, you know, in the 30s and 40s probably wasn't that easy uh, because of the Southern Baptist nature of, of Georgia at that time. I mean, being a Catholic would probably be almost as bad as being a Jew or a uh, Muslim. Um, awful lot of Baptists would not consider a Catholic to be a Christian at that time, okay? Um, she attended the University of Washington, University of Iowa Writers Workshop, got her master's degree in writing there, then lived in New York and Connecticut for several months with a bunch of other writers. So she had an ex she had experience of being around uh, my terminology, a bunch of intellectual eggheads for a couple of years. So she she knew the the intellectual ideas that were swirling around in the forties and. 50s, okay? This is kind of important um, because of what she says in this little letter on page 467 on faith. Now, this is a short snippet. This letter is actually, if I remember right, page and a half long or so. Might be a little bit longer than that. If I can find it, I think I've got it saved. I'll put it on the D2L um, website because it's got some interesting stuff in it. The letter's written to another young woman um, who had read some of her stuff and was intrigued by it. The young woman is not a Christian. Flannery O'Connor obviously is. And she says, you know, she, she's kind of troubled by it because it's it's almost like O'Connor is, is, or her writing is chasing her into the church, okay? And they have a long correspondence that goes back and forth. And O'Connor essentially says, you know, you can't become a Christian until you're really sure that it's true. In other words, don't just do it because it'll make you feel good or, or something like that. Anyways, the woman asked her, you know, why do you write the way you do? I mean, you got weird people in your stories. And she does. She's, she's got a lot of what are often called freaks. Southern literature um, often has a lot of <coughs> grotesque characters in it, grotesque figures. They often are, you know, the result of incest or the result of war, disfigured people, or they are mentally not well. Um, one of Faulkner's famous novels, Sound and Fury. Uh, Sound and Fury has as one of its narrators Benji Compton. Benji Compton is an idiot. I don't mean he's an idiot like you might say your friend is an idiot for doing something. I mean, he's a literal idiot. He's got like an IQ of 70. Okay? He gets the title from Shakespeare's Macbeth, Sound and Fury signifying nothing. Okay? So, moron. That's, that's a grotesque kind of a character. You get other people. You have in one of the short stories in here, a woman with a wooden leg, and the leg gets taken from her. Fancy woman. It's been a long time since I read it. This story that we're going to be reading, you have the misfit. I mean, he's, he's even titled, named, according to this kind of thing. He doesn't belong, all right? So she's kind of writing and wanting to know, why do you write these stories the way you do? So O'Connor answers. I write the way I do because, not though, I am a Catholic. This is a fact, and nothing covers it like the bald statement. However, I am a Catholic peculiarly possessed of the modern consciousness. The thing Jung, that's Carl Jung, describes as unhistorical, solitary, and guilty. To possess this, that is the modern consciousness, within the church is to bear a burden, the necessary burden for the conscious Catholic. We're going to go back and talk about this at read it all. 
It's to feel the contemporary situation at the ultimate level. I think that the church is the only thing that is going to make the terrible world we are coming to endurable. The only thing that makes the church endurable is that it is somehow the body of Christ and that on this we are fed. It seems to be a fact that you suffer as much from the church as for it. But if you believe in the divinity of Christ, you have to cherish the world at the same time that you struggle to endure it. This may explain the lack of bitterness in the stories. Okay, so first sentence. She writes the way she does because she is a Catholic. Notice the little part in parentheses. How different would the sentence be if it read, I write the way I do, though I am a Catholic. The though I am a Catholic would make it sound like, well, a good Catholic should not be writing stories like this. Because her stories involve, some of them, rape, murder, incest, robbery. Okay. And some of these are done by the quote-unquote good guys. <laughs> so she says, I write the way I do because I am a Catholic. She writes with all these grotesque figures because, that is, her Catholicism isn't accidental in the writing. It fills, it informs why she writes the way she does, okay? So, this is the fact and nothing covers it like the bald statement. In other words, if you can't accept that, then you're not going to accept anything else. However, I am a Catholic peculiarly possessed of the modern consciousness. So what does that mean? What's the modern consciousness? Hold that for just a moment. To possess this, this modern consciousness, within the church is to bear a burden, the necessary burden for the conscious Catholic. Notice, conscious Catholic. That is, the aware, the thinking, the intellectual Catholic. Not the, oh, I was born Catholic, I was born into a Catholic home, I was baptized and confirmed, but I never go to church, I don't pray, it doesn't mean anything to me, etc., etc. No. Conscience. It's to feel the contemporary situation at the ultimate level. Okay, now here's where I have to stop and unpack a little. So what's the modern consciousness, first of all? And what is the contemporary situation at the ultimate level? This is where you have to back up. She's writing this in 1953. The modern consciousness isn't something that's just floating through the air in 1953. We've got to back up a couple of centuries at least. Right? Let's start with this period, the late 17th century. That is, 1680s, 1690s, beginning then. We have the development of what's called in, in history of philosophy, the Enlightenment. So what's the Enlightenment? It's also called the age of reason. This is when human reason kind of takes the fore in terms of learning and, the, and one's approach to the world. It's the idea that we can solve all our problems with human reason. You know, it's, it's um, what's his name? Not Galileo, not Bacon, gravity. It's Newton discovering the laws of gravity and starting to apply the laws of gravity, the laws of physics, to understand how the planets move and all that kind of stuff. Okay? And then it's taking some of those laws and applying them to human relationships, to the natural world, etc., etc. So the Enlightenment goes on, and what goes on, what kind of happens simultaneously with the Enlightenment? First of all, why is it called the Enlightenment? Because to be enlightened means what? Like a light bulb up, goes off in here. You're suddenly aware, intellectually aware. It implies that before then, people were living in what? Darkness. So that prior to the period just before this, the Renaissance, you had the Dark Ages. Okay? Renaissance means rebirth. It's the rebirth of the classical learning. So then you get the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment... People become even more enlightened after the Renaissance. They're, they're starting to think more about the world or about them, and they're showing less emphasis on what? 
faith, belief. Things that cannot be rationally understood, reasonably accepted. Okay? So some of those old beliefs become superstitions and such. Well, what else? That's, that begins late, eight, late 17th century. You go through the 18th century, this keeps progressing, and what do we see beginning happening in the late 18th century and going through the 19th century? You have the rise of the industrial period. The industrial age. How does that occur? It's born directly out of this. We can create machines and such because we understand physics. Physics comes out of the Enlightenment, right? Simultaneously with all of that, again, faith becomes less and less and less important. What big major book gets published in little after the middle of the 19th century, 1859, written by a biologist who took a sailing trip to the Galapagos Islands. Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. And what did Darwin suggest in that? Man wasn't made in the image of God. Man was descended from monkeys, which were, according to later evolutionary thought, Descended from things that were kind of like monkeys, that were descended from things. And you trace it all the way back to, I was just reading an article the other day. Some scientists thought, some Australian scientists thought, they found the oldest fossils in the world in Greenland. The majority of scientists say, no, that's, that's not right, because they don't have these particular quote-unquote signatures. The previous... Scientists who thought they found the oldest fossils are still the ones that are correct. Well, those oldest fossils are actually from Australia. They're 3.7 billion years old. Single-celled organisms. Okay. Three point. That's what we, according to this theory, ultimately all descend from. Okay. So that's, you know, Darwin. You go to the end of the 19th century, and what... what what major kind of, oh, what do I, how do I want to describe this? Scar on the human race, or at least scar on the Western white human race is removed. Starts in England, then comes to the United States several decades later, end of slavery. You get the turn of the 19th century to the 20th century. And a lot of thinkers, philosophers, poets, writers, theologians, are thinking the 20th century, man, it's going to be great. Okay? Karl Marx has written the Communist Manifesto. What is the Communist Manifesto? Communist Manifesto essentially say that once everybody understands what he's talking about and we reach the perfect communist society, what will there be? There will be total equality. There will be everybody will have the same stuff. Nobody will be poor, etc. Okay? That would happen in the 20th century. Karl Marx died. Right? Two publications began being published in the early 20th century, journals. One was called the Progressive Century. One was called the Christian Century. Okay. Progressive there, as in its modern political connotation. I am a progressive. Okay. This idea that we can solve all human problems with what? Reason. With enough reason, enough science, enough money, enough technology, we can do what? This was literally thought to be the case as of 1901, that this would start happening. We would put an end to hunger. We would put an end to poverty. We would put an end to child labor. I mean, child labor laws began. We would put an end to war. We would put an end to all of the problems that plague humanity. Okay? 
That was kind of for the secular branch. The Christian group thought we will reach this period of human perfection where everybody will be like Jesus. You know, turn the other cheek and share the cloak and the whole nine yards. And it will all happen here. Right? And what happens? Less than 15 years into that progressive Christian nirvana to mix metaphors and religions. World War I. It's not called World War I. What's it called? During the war and shortly thereafter. The Great War. Why is it the Great War? Why weren't, why wasn't the Crimean War in the 1860s the Great War? Why wasn't the Spanish-American War the Great War? Well, it was the Spanish and American War. It was us and the Spaniards. That's it. Right? The Crimean War could have had claim to being a great war because it involved great powers. It involved Russia and England and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The Napoleonic Wars involved Napoleon against the English, okay, somewhat against the Spaniards. You had all these other wars before then, but they're primarily between two opposing forces or maybe three or four. How's the Great War different? It's the world. In other words, with a few exceptions, as Bob Dylan famously sang, you got to choose somebody. Everybody had to choose a side. Okay? The war, what was it called once it ended? To end all wars. They thought this thing was so horrific, we'll never go to war again. It ends in 1918. When World War II break out? September 1st, 1939. They barely even get two decades past. Okay. It's World War II. It's the war to end all war, right? Nope. What happens within five years of World War II? World War II ends when? 1945. Right? Five years later, we have the Korean War. Oh, sorry. It's not a war. It's a conflict. And we're still in conflict, right? It's the only war the United States has been involved in that never ended. We are still technically at war with North Korea. Okay? Which is why you crazy little fat man a couple years ago was shooting off rockets and you know they had the little uh, meeting in Singapore and they're gonna have another one later on this year, sir. Right? Korean War ends. 19, late 53, so she writes and publishes this before the Korean War is over, I think, right? What little war happens shortly after that? We are not involved necessarily. The, what's called the Indochina War. Later on, it gets called the Vietnam War. When we get involved, early 1960s, I mean, we're sending, quote, unquote, advisors over in the late 50s to the French, because they're the ones involved in that war. And then we later on take it over. We don't get out until 74, right? So, so much for the progressive, progressive century and the Christian century, okay? So that's part of the modern consciousness. Well, what's some of the other parts of the modern consciousness. Concomitant with that decline in faith in whatever religion, doesn't matter which religion, it's you know just a decline in faith. Concomitant in the, with that is a rise in philosophy of a couple of major ideas. This one and kind of its offshoot, this one, okay? Now, Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus, Albert Camus were French philosophers, writers, intellectuals in the 1930s, 40s, 20s. They both died in the 60s, I believe. <clears throat> Camus died in the 60s, I know. Sartre might have been in the 70s. And 
they both kind of simultaneously came up with the same idea, this, this philosophy called existentialism. They're not the originators of it. There was a Danish theologian slash philosopher back in the 19th century named Soren Kierkegaard. He kind of came up with it. He just didn't use the term that they used. Right? And this main idea is existentialism. Existentialism essentially says, <clears throat> has several little tenets to it. Ten nets, that's beliefs to it. One, I'm going to do these in a different order than I did my first class. No supernatural. That's it. No supernatural. Two, no meaning to life. Three, you must make your own meaning. Okay? There's no God, there's no devil. There's no divine reward, there's no divine punishment. If you die, that's it. What you think of as your soul isn't really real. It's just your mind kind of playing tricks with you. Because once you die, and those electrons stop firing, those synapses stop firing in your brain, what you think of as you, that's it. That's the end, period. As Hamlet says, food for worms. Okay? Therefore, there's no meaning to life. We are simply the product of chance. The universe supposedly is 13.8 billion years old. Why? Because 13.8 billion years ago, a singularity smaller than, I'm going to use you know, my fingers, but it's obviously wrong, smaller than the amount of space between my fingers, it's actually smaller than, the, than a quark, which is a part of an atom. Something that small blew up. We don't know why. We don't know what existed before this, or what put this spot there, but it blew up and everything started happening. We're the result now of that. Okay? Doesn't mean there might not be other results somewhere else. Okay? You know, people are still out there looking for life and you know all that kind of stuff. But essentially. We're merely the product of time and chance. That's it. All right? So there's no meaning to your existence. Don't mean to be a downer before lunch, but, you know, accept it. So they said, because there's no external meaning to your life, and because we need for there to be meaning, a famous psychologist in the mid, late 50s, early 60s, wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. The guy's name was Viktor Frankl. He was a concentration camp survivor. And he said, you know, one of the things that we discovered in the camps is people would go on. That is, even though they were being horribly treated, abused, starved, beaten, etc., they still kept going still wanted to live. Why? Because they have this search for meaning, that there's got to be a reason why I'm here. So Camus and Sartre and other existentialists said, you got to make your own meaning. How do you do that? You authenticate your existence. You become the author of your life. You write your life story. Well, how do you do that? How do you write your life story? Now, I don't mean you sit down with a piece of paper and write, a, write an autobiography. Because, let's face it, for most people, that'd be boring. <laughs> I mean, you don't want to read your own, you want to read somebody else's life. So how do you authenticate your existence? You act. That's it. You act. You do something so that once you're dead, those who come after you will say, that treasure in him, he made a difference. He lived. 
even though they might not never have known treasure. I mean, we might be talking 100 years after, and people are still talking about them, right? Because we still talk about people that have been dead for 100 years. There's an awful lot of people that we don't talk about who have been dead for 100 years, right? If you haven't seen it, oh, I think I've referred to it before in here. The latest Disney film, is it Coco? I think it is. What, you know, the Day of the Dead thing in, in Mexico. Watch that. Why? Because that essentially gets that if there's nobody here to remember you, then in the quote unquote afterlife, you will disappear. So it's important to have people afterwards who remember you, you know, set up their little prayer altars and, and stuff like that. Okay? So, you authenticate yourself by doing something. Now, I kind of implied, actually, I didn't imply. I didn't imply anything about what treasure might do to make people 100 years from now remember treasure ground. But let's go back to, you know, what we were talking about over here, World War I. Some stupid, crazy Serb does what to begin World War I? I don't remember the guy's name, but he's in history books. He shot Archduke Ferdinand. Okay. I remember, because I remember seeing it on TV, when Sirhan Sirhan shot Bobby Kennedy. I remember when John Hinckley shot Ronald Reagan. Okay. Saw it live on TV. I mean, I wasn't there, but I saw it on TV. Okay. Uh, will people remember John? Yes, they will. Notice both two, two examples. Are those good examples of people remembering you? Are those like um, Jonas Salk, the guy who came up with the cure for polio? No, I've known people, I know people who had polio as youths who walked with a limp. Okay? Fortunate, well, I'll take that back. Polio is making a comeback, it hasn't been totally eradicated. If you have kids, please get them vaccinated. Service announcement. Um, so you can do horrible things and authenticate your existence. You can do good things. How often are history books, how often do they recount the quote unquote all the good things done by people? Doesn't it kind of tend to be, or let's use a different example. What usually shows up on the news? Yeah, your reaction told me. It's the bad stuff, right? Shakespeare has a line in Julius Caesar. The good that men do are oft interred with their bones. The evil lives after. The good things, nobody remembers. The bad stuff, that's what people remember. People remember what with Nixon? Watergate. They don't remember Nixon went to China. Nixon was the only one who could quote unquote go to China. Why? He was the most arch communist Republican there was, other than crazy old Joe McCarthy. All right? So, you can be the Boy Scout, proverbially stopping the little old lady from walking out into the busy traffic as the semi comes across, or you can push her. Doesn't matter. Either way, you've made the world know that you exist. You can stop the murderers at Columbine High School, or you can be one of the murderers at Columbine High School. I, I told my first class, how many know what happened in the Crimea two days ago? How many of you know where the Crimea is? It's a little peninsula of land out into the Black Sea. Right? used to be part of Ukraine. Russia invaded it a couple years ago, took control of it. 17, I think he was 17, 17-year-old 17 kid, college student, went to his college, I see two heads nodding, went to his college the other day with a shotgun and killed 18 people, including himself. He authenticated his existence. He made meaning to his life. Because part of 
what this teaches is, I had it up here somewhere. There's no external source for morality. That is, morality is kind of what we say it is. What is right, what is wrong, is what we say it is. What we say it is when? It depends. That is, morality isn't absolute. It's relative. It might be relative to a time. It might be relative to a place, according to this. So what, we, what might be right for one people, one culture, might not be right for another people or another culture. Is there a problem with that belief? Is there a problem with that idea? Saying it's okay here, but it's not okay here? Well, if, if you take that idea and you take it to its logical conclusion, if you ever want to test the validity of an idea, take it to its logical conclusion. What does it ultimately lead to? Here's what this idea relative morality leads to. Hitler was right. Or the KKK was right. Well, who in here thinks the KKK was right? That blacks ought to be strung up. Blacks ought to be enslaved. Well, I don't think anybody in here thinks that. Who in here thinks Hitler was right? The Jews are the problems for Germany. I don't think anybody in here does. But if you accept this, then there is no reason why we can say Hitler was wrong. It worked for him. Got him out of the Depression a lot sooner than we got out of the Depression. I mean, he had Germany just humming right along there. Of course, it did mean having to displace a lot of people, take a lot of their homes and property, and start killing them, but, you know... Worked for him. That's the problem with it. Now, an offshoot of existentialism is nihilism. This branch, even though it comes before Camus and Sartre, comes from the thinking, the writings of Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche was a 19th century German, uh, German philosopher. Kind of interesting, I think. You know, call it poetic justice. He dies of insanity. Nihilism says what? I mean, we see part of that word, the N-I-H-I-L in the word annihilate. What does it mean to annihilate something? Destroy. You destroy it. So nihilism is the idea that there is no meaning in life and there can never be any meaning in life. That is, you can't authenticate your existence. It's the idea that we don't matter, period. We're nothing except the reality. We are nothing. I'm no better than this marker. I might have a little higher IQ, but psh, so what? That's just because of chance. Okay? What do you think this kind of mentality can lead to? Hitler. <laughs> Hitler loved Nietzsche because Nietzsche came up with, should have mentioned this in my first class, Nietzsche came up with the idea of the Ubermensch or the over or Superman. Not the guy in tights and a cape. This is the person who doesn't have to follow the laws. Why? Because he's better than everybody else. He's got ideas that are better than everybody else. He can't be constrained by everybody else. This is Lord Voldemort in the Harry Potter stories. He thinks this entirely. The other the, the laws don't apply to him. Okay? Yeah, you could, I mean, yeah, you could say that. I mean, the existentialists would say that. Nietzsche would say, you, no matter what you do, you're still a meaningless piece of just stuff. So you might have become like a Superman. Well, 
Yeah, it is contradictory, but it's it's kind of a way of overcoming your meaninglessness. Because Nietzsche argued that, you know, there are certain people that should not be bound by the dictates of society. Those are the, the over, those, essentially, what does it boil down to? Those are the rulers, and the rest of us, we're the ruled. Okay? You want a good example? Look at the Communist Party in whatever country that tries to practice communism. The party is what? The people in power. Who are the proletariat? That's the worker bees. They're not the ones in power. You want a bit of power? You want a bit of freedom? You've got to join the party. Soviet Union is the part, uh, the example par excellence of this. Or read um, 1984 by George Orwell. You, you really get this lived out. So nihilism, there's no purpose in life. There's no meaning in life. So what does this mean if you, again, you take that idea to its logical consequence, logical uh, thing in, and you actually believe it? Do you have hope? No. Life is totally meaningless. It's this idea that informs almost every mass school shooting in the United States. Dylan Klebold and the other guy in Columbine, we have stuff they left behind that is written matter. They fit this to a T. They weren't just shooting people up because they were angry at them because they treated them badly. They shot them up because why not? Okay, We're going to see that idea in this story. So all of this that I've been talking about for the last 20 minutes, 30 minutes, is what she's talking about when she says, when she talks about the modern consciousness and feeling the contemporary situation at the ultimate level. 1953, a Irish author wrote a play called Waiting for Godot. Waiting for Godot is a preeminent example of what's called theater of the absurd. Why? Because you have these people who sit there and they're waiting for the guy named for Godot to come, and he never comes. And what they arrive at in their talk and in, in, in conversation is life is utterly meaningless, period. And then you die, all right? So she goes on and says, the church is the only thing that can help this. And that's for one reason, because the church is the body of Christ. And who is Christ? Christ is God incarnate. And she says, because Christ is God incarnate, because he is divine, we have to do what? You have to cherish the world at the same time as you struggle with it. Well, why do you have to cherish the world? Because God, who is spirit, that is non-matter, becomes physical stuff. And therefore, physical stuff becomes important. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, etc. The world there doesn't mean earth. It doesn't mean Israel. It doesn't mean the United States. It doesn't mean Sudan. It doesn't. The Greek there is cosmos. Everything. Okay? And that's why she says her stories lack bitterness. There's, there's not a bitter taste. There's not a bitter tone. That is, there's a lot of weird stuff, grotesque stuff, right? But it's not kind of like she wants you to just close the story and blow your brains out, as there is with some literature. I would argue, for example, Catcher in the Rye. What's the point of it? Catch-22. I mean, we get a phrase that comes from that title of that book. Catch, Because what does it mean to be caught in a catch-22? You're damned if you do. You're damned if you don't. So why not? Okay. Turn to the beginning of the story. A good man is hard to find. What do they get?
getting ready to do when the story opens. They're going to go on a road trip. Okay? Where are they heading? Florida. Listen to Grandma, the grandmother. Bailey, her only son, sitting at the table, reading his newspaper, and she says, Now look here, Bailey. See here, read this. Here this fellow calls himself the misfit. He's a loose from a federal pen, headed toward Florida. You read here what it says he did to these people. Just you read it. I wouldn't take my children any direction with a criminal like that loose. Couldn't answer to my conscience if I did. What has O'Connor just done? But she just shows technique of writing. Foreshadow. Why? Because that's exactly what they do. They do go in the direction of where the misfit is. And she does take her children there. Notice, does Bailey engage her in conversation? Does he respond in any way? Nope. Neither does his wife. So we have the grandmother, we have Bailey, Mrs. Bailey, because she's never named. We have the baby, never named. Son, John Wesley, daughter, June Star. Notice, the wife doesn't say anything. Why not? Why do Bailey and Mrs. Bailey not respond at all? He doesn't even look up. He keeps reading his sports page. You get the impression that this might not be the first time that she has st stood over him while he's eating and reading the newspaper. <laughs> kind of like the teachers in the old Charlie Brown cartoons. You know, wah, 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 wah. The children speak. After she says... Children have been to Florida before. You all have to take them somewhere else for a change. So they would see different parts of the world be broad. They never have been to East Tennessee. I was talking about this with one of my kids the other day. My son, who's in law school, goes, oh, yeah, like going to East Tennessee, that's really broadening the horizons. Well, if you've never been out of Georgia, maybe. Children's mother doesn't hear, but eight-year-old John Wesley if you don't want to go to Florida, why don't you stay at home? The little girl, June Star, she wouldn't stay at home and be queen for a day. Okay, I don't know about you. You don't have to say anything, but if you have a grandmother who's alive, if you had a grandmother who was alive when you were eight years old, and you spoke to her like that, what would happen? Yeah. And this can mean death. <laughs> My grandmother was a 90 pound, four foot nine woman. She'd have beat the snot out of me, probably. And if she did, my folks would have. So, so what do we think of little John Wesley and June Star? Well adjusted, good manners. They're what? Louder? Little shits. Little shits. <laughs> They're brats. How do children become brats? They're not born brats. Their parents. Their parents. Why their parents? Why does everybody always want to blame the parents? They spoil them. How? They baby them. How else? They let them get away with everything. What are we going to see? They're in the car. If you don't stop this, I'm going to stop this car. And Ten miles later. If you don't stop this, I'm going to stop this car. My dad was one of those. He'd stop the car first time. You wouldn't get the, if you're going to stop this. It'd just be, ah! and Okay. So. Grandma asked, so what would you do if you saw this, this misfit? John Wesley, I'd smack his face. June Star, she wouldn't stay home for a million bucks. She has to go everywhere we go. Ooh, there's a 
family need a little counseling maybe. <laughs> what have we just been told? The immediate family, the nuclear family, doesn't seem to have any what? Privacy? Any time away? Well, what are we told about grandma? She lives with them. Okay. So, next morning, who's in the car first? Grandma. Even though she doesn't want to go to Florida. She's in the car. She's got her suitcase. She got her has her cat pity sing in its basket under the suitcase. How is she dressed? Hat. What else? Dress with little white flowers. We're told. Uh, navy blue straw sailor hat. A bunch of white violets on the brim. Navy blue dress with a small white dot in the print. White gloves, which she takes off and puts on the back shelf by the rear window. Why is she dressed like this? If she's dead on the side of the road, is what it says. In case of an accident, anyone seeing her dead on the highway would know at once that she was a lady. Really? Does it matter that much once you're dead? I mean, if you're dead and somebody goes, oh, look, she was a lady. According to all this, so <laughs> there's no you there anymore. So they keep driving. John Wesley says, let's go through Georgia fast. We don't have to look at it much. Grandmother, I wouldn't talk about my native state that way if I were a little boy. Tennessee has mountains. Georgia has hills. John Wesley, Tennessee's just a hillbilly dumping ground. And Georgia's a lousy state, too. June Star, he said it. Again, where do they get this? Where do John Wesley and June Star get this? Do they get this from hearing their parents bitch and moan about Georgia being a crappy state? Could be. I mean, where do children get their ideas from? Three major places. One, family. Two, school. Three, friends. And maybe four, though not as much anymore today, church. Or one's religious affiliation. Okay? Grandmother. In my time, children were more respectful of their native states and their parents, and everything else. Little brats. People did right then. Oh, look at the cute little pickaninny. She looks out as they're driving. She says and points to a Negro child standing in the door of a shack. Wouldn't that make a picture now, she asked. And the little boy waves. June Star, he didn't have any britches on. Grandma probably didn't have any. Little niggers in the country don't have things like we do. If I could paint, I'd paint that picture. Why would she paint the picture of the naked little black boy standing in her doorway, waving to her? Because I think it goes back to her beginning of her little speech here. In my time. For her, this is a snapshot of like the good old days. When white people and black people knew their places. People did right then, she says. And what comes immediately after that? The cute little pickaninny. This little black child. It's kind of like, well, he's doing right. He's doing what he ought to do. Being naked in the doorway. They keep driving. They pass a cotton field with five or six graves fenced in the middle. Grandmother makes a joke about it being with the plantation. The boy says, what plantation? Gone with the wind. They stop at the tower to eat. And they meet Red Sammy and Red Sammy's wife, who's never named. And Red Sammy's wife, bottom 429, asks June Star, would you like to come be my little girl? She goes, no, no, I would not. No, I certainly wouldn't. 
wouldn't live in a broken down place like this for a million bucks. And she said, isn't she cute? And then we get introduced to Red Sammy. Red Sammy says, top of 430, you can't win. These days, you don't know who to trust. Ain't that the truth? Okay. Red Sammy's a mechanic, and he owns the place. How's he dressed? He puts a shirt on when he comes in. But when he first shows up, he doesn't have a shirt on. We'll stop there. We'll pick up with 4.30. If there's a quiz on Monday, it'll be over good man. It's hard to find you know, any of this stuff. Um, I don't know that there will be. We should finish it. And I'll let you know Monday if there's going to be an exam.